Hello, Living Environment students. So today we will be learning about evolution. And so, of course, we have a fun little picture to start us off. And so it's of a human saying, hey, I'm being followed by monkeys. And that is kind of true because humans did evolve from monkeys. So technically, this human is being followed by monkeys. Alrighty, so we have some evolution vocabulary. So our first term is natural selection. And this is the survival and reproduction of organisms with particular traits. And usually the organisms who have traits that help them survive in a particular environment will then be able to reproduce and have those traits passed on to the next generation. And so it's essentially the survival of the fittest, whichever organism is the most fit to survive in the, their environment will be able to survive and reproduce. The next term is evolution. And this is the change in genetic characteristics of a population from one generation to the next. So because of natural selection, those organisms with good traits will be able to pass those traits on to the next generation. And those organisms with not as good traits will not be able to survive and reproduce and pass their traits on to the next generation. So the traits that were good will go on to the next generation. So that will cause the genetic characteristics of a population to change over time because whichever trait was best uh, adapted to its environment was able to survive and reproduce and go to the next generation. Then I just said the word adapt, so we'll go over the word adaptation. And this is the process of becoming adapted to an environment. And this is an anatomical, physiological, or behavioral change that improves a population's ability to survive. So as I just said, if an organism is adapted to their environment, then they will be able to survive to the next generation. We'll give you a bunch of different examples of this, but if an organism has a trait that allows them to survive in the environment that they're living in, they will be able to reproduce and go on to the next generation and their traits will be able to be given to the offspring, which will then be present in the next generation. Alrighty. So if you uh, have ever been in Miss Haller's classroom, you will see little Darwins everywhere. So it's about time that we explain who Charles Darwin is. So Darwin was a naturalist and he sailed on a boat called the Beagle and he is most famous for his voyage to the Galapagos Islands. And he wrote The Origin of Species, which will explain what he did at the Galapagos Islands soon. So he noticed that organisms in a population differ slightly from each other in appearance and behavior. Hmm, what could that be called? So Darwin proposed that the environment influences which individual will survive to produce offspring. That's what we've been saying. So he is the one who, has, who discovered this. So he said some individuals, because of certain traits, are more likely to survive and reproduce than others. Exactly what we just said on the previous slide, but he is the one who came up with these ideas. All right, so we have a little fun meme with Charles Darwin. So he says, I talked about the survival of the fittest before the Hunger Games. So Charles Darwin knew what he was talking about even before the Hunger Games came out, the movie. They just copied him, so. Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin is the OG of the Hunger Games. <laughs> Alrighty, so there are four steps to Darwin's theory. Step one is overproduction. So this is when more offspring were produced than will survive. So it's kind of like overpopulation, not really, but there's, there's more offspring produced in a population than will survive because of resources and stuff like that. The next step is variation. This is where every population has variations in their population. So the traits vary within a population. The third step is selection. So this is where it gets interesting. So this is where a particular variation, so the term before, so a specific trait, will be more or less likely to survive than another variation. Those with a particular variation will survive and produce offspring with the same variation, which we'll give an example of in a minute. So 
you can visually see it. <clears throat> but basically, there's different traits within a population, and the organisms with the trait that are most favorable will be able to survive and reproduce and have that variation be in the next generation because it's in their offspring. And then the fourth step is adaptation. So over time, those traits that, uh, that improve survival and reproduction will become more common. So if that trait initially helps that organism survive and he, was, or he or she was able to reproduce, then because that trait was so favorable, it will be passed on to more and more offspring and it will become more common in that population. All righty. So there were a few problems with Darwin's theory. He did make this theory very, 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 very long time ago. So he just had to work with what he knew or what was already discovered, which wasn't too much. So Darwin's major blank spot or just gap in his ideas was genetics. So he understood that inherit, inherited variation was the backbone to his ideas, but he did not have the mechanism for his inheritance. So he understood what inherited variation was, but he didn't know really how this worked, what the mechanism was behind inheritance. So just to give you a little timeline, Darwin's theory happened in 1859. And then Mendel, Gregor Mendel, he made his genetics theory in, 1900, in the 1900s, which was 40 years later. So Darwin's gaps about what um, the mechanism was for inheritance was now complete because as we know, you need genes to be inherited by the offspring in order for those traits to be passed on. So the traits are the genes that are being passed on. And we understood genes, but Watson and Crick didn't finish the DNA structure until 1958. So DNA, the structure of DNA was not even discovered until 58 years until after Mendel discovered the genetic theory. So these things happened very far apart, but over time people were able to put other scientists' um, ideas together and come up with new ideas. So that's how we know everything now, because scientists questioned the world and wanted to know. It's always good to question. All right, so here's an example. This is where I'm going to really help you visualize. So first we start off uh, with deer that live in a warm climate, so it's warm, and some have, but some have thicker fur than others. So these darker brown guys have thicker fur than the lighter brown guys. And then this next step was that some deers become separated from the rest of the group. So nothing special here, really. They just become separated. They're not all together now. But this is where it gets important. So the third step is in the cold mountain climate, deer with thicker fur are more likely to survive. So now it got really, really cold and it's no longer warm. So because it's so cold, the deer with, without the thick coats will die. So as you can see, these deer without the thick coats unfortunately died because it got so cold. But the deers who had the trait for thick fur were able to survive. So as years pass, each generation has a greater portion of deer with thicker fur. And after many generations, most deer have thick fur. So what happened was this trait of thick fur was favorable. So these deer were able to survive in their environment. So they were the fittest in their environment and they were able to survive and pass that favorable trait on to their offspring. And then their offspring were able to, to survive because they had that favorable trait. And then they were able to pass it on to their offspring. And then after some time, this thick fur trait became favorable and became common. So as you can see, it was favorable and then it is very common. Alrighty, so here's another example. So one, so we have four different creatures here. So the first is the pac pacacitan, pacacitas. Yeah, that's how we're gonna say it. 
So scientists think that whales evolved from these land-dwelling mammals. So that means that they live on land. Um, so the fossil skeleton of these mammals is shown right here. So as you can see, they have hind legs and they have uh, front legs too. And these mammals lived about 50 million years ago and they walked or run on four legs and ate meat. So they used all four legs to move and they ate meat. So then about a million years later, we have these new creatures called the Ambulucetas. Even with phonetics, I just can't say it. It's fine. And these are mammals of uh, this genus. They lived in coastal waters, so now they live in the water, not land. And they lived about 49 million years ago, so one million years later, which is a lot of years. These mammals could swim by kicking their legs and using their tail for balance. They could also use their short legs to waddle on land. They breathed air through their mouths. So they did swim in water and they used their hind legs and their tail to do so to navigate and balance. And they also were able to go on land with their uh, front, their front legs, not legs, but um, yeah, I guess they are their legs, their front hands, whatever they're called. Um, and they breathed air, so they still breathe regular air. They don't breathe underwater. So then we have the Dorodon. Dorodon. I think that was a little bit easier to say. And this is a mammal um, that lived in the oceans about 40 million years ago, so 9 million years after. And they resembled giant dolphins in the way that they swam and breathed. And they had tiny hind limbs that were of no use in swimming. So they still had the hind legs, but they really served no use for them in swimming. Um, and they, as we said, resembled dolphins. So we're getting closer and closer to dolphins. And then last, we have modern whales. All right, so all modern whales have forelimbs. That's the word, forelimbs. Um, that are flippers used for swimming. So as you can see, these whales have little flippers. So cute. And no whales have hind legs, but some toothed whales have tiny hip bones. So these hind legs are originally in these creatures that were um, around many, 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 many years ago. Those hind legs um, turned into hip bones or just nothing at all. So those went away. Um, all modern whales must come up to the surface of the water to breathe through a hole at the top of their head. So they still, even though they swim in water, they still cannot, they have to come up above the water for air. So as you can see, as we get down the list, certain things were taken away. So the hind legs were slowly taken away, but you can see that certain structures are the same. So we have this like backbone that is the same over here. And then we have the face shape that is the same. And the ribs and everything. And because certain characteristics are similar and function the same, that shows us that these creatures, these, well, these whales, really, they evolved from this mammal up here, Pachycetan. Pachycetas. I'm going to get that eventually. All right. So we have a fun song about Charles Sarwin. So enjoy because it's so much fun. Yeah. 
So this talked about Darwin and Lamarck. Um, Lamarck, he actually tried to theorize what was happening here as well. And he believed that, as you saw in the giraffe example, that if a giraffe had a shorter neck, he would just stretch his neck and reach the leaves. And then that new adaptation or that new, yeah, that new neck that he just grew would be passed on to the offspring and so that's not what happens it what happens is a certain trait happens when a organism is born and because this trait is favorable when the organism was born then this trait this organism will be able to survive and reproduce to the next generation and pass this trait on to the next generation but it's not it didn't happen during its lifetime. It didn't grow a long neck and then it was able to pass on to the generation after, after it. it was born with this long neck. So just remember that Darwin was the one that was right. All right, let's go to the next slide. Yeah. Okay, so next we have biogeography. So Organisms that are found in similar habitats but in totally different places may evolve similar characteristics. So here's an example down here. All three of these large birds live in grasslands, so that's a habitat, a grassland is a habitat, but on separate continents, so on totally different parts of the earth. So this bird lives in South America, the second one lives in Africa, and the third one lives in Australia. So totally different places, but they all live in grasslands, so they have very similar characteristics. As you can see, their necks are very similarly shaped, their bodies are very similarly shaped, and they both walk on two legs, which are also very similarly shaped. So because they live in uh, similar habitats, they had similar adaptations to that habitat, and they, as a result, can look very similar even though they live on totally separate continents because they adapted to those grasslands over time through many generations. And so even though they're on different continents, they adapted to that specific habitat and that's why they all look very, very similar even though they are on totally different continents because different continents can have similar habitats, even though they're in different parts of the world. All right, next we have developmental biology or, or embryology. So this is about an embryo, uh, when it's growing as an embryo. 
So the way multicellular organisms develop suggests that they evolved from similar organisms. So this is another way that we can see how organisms are related to one another. So if we look over here, we can see a fish and a salamander they look very, very similar in the embryo stage. They both have these like little tail-like things and very thin at the top, which means they're very similar. You can also see the way that they're shaped here is very similar. They're like upright. Um, they're more like vertical. And then they're also very similar here. So that means that they're very closely related. Next, we have turtles and chickens. As you can see, they look very, very similar here and here. And finally here, because you can see the shape of their head, they have that little like like pointy nose-ish kind of thing. And you can see that the way that they're like sitting also, and they have tails, little tails, that goes away. They have a little tail there too. And then we have rabbits and humans. As you can see, they're very similar here and here and here. And also here, you can see they're very similar. They have the two legs, the two arms, and they're positioned very similarly. As you can see, these four turtles, chickens, rabbits, and humans are also, they look very similar in the embryo stage, which means that they're, they can have evolved from a common ancestor. Awesome. So next we're going to talk a little bit about anatomy. So first we have homologous structures. And these are characteristics or structures that are similar in two or more species that um, have been inherited from a common ancestor. So if we look at the different kind of bones here, we have the humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. So as you can see by the color coded, all four of these organisms have the humerus, all four of them have the radius, all four of them have the ulna, all four of them have the carpals, which are right here. All four of them have the metacarpals, which are right here. And all four of them have the phalanges, which are right here. That's one of my favorite words to say, phalanges. Um, so because they all have these bones in common, because they all have these bones, that suggests that they all were, ha have inherited these bones or characteristics from a common ancestor, meaning that alligators, humans, bats, and penguins came from a common ancestor because they have these similar characteristics or structures. Then we have vestigial structures, which are remnants of a structure that an ancestor had, but is now useless in the current species. So um, examples are the vestigial tail. So obviously we do not have tails, but there is a vestigial tail that we do have in our bodies. We have an appendix. Well, some of us. And we also have tonsils. And another example that's not on here is wisdom teeth. So as you may know, some people have to get their appendix and tonsils and wisdom teeth out. And that's because it gets irritated or inflamed. So they have to get it removed. And it's okay if you get it removed because you don't need it because it's a vestigial structure. It was needed by your common ancestors a long, long, long time ago, but you don't need it anymore. So for example, wisdom teeth, your common ancestors needed them, but over time, humans' mouths have gotten a lot smaller, not a lot, but it have gotten smaller that we do not need those wisdom teeth anymore. And we also don't live like the cavemen and women did. We didn't have to eat very tough meat and stuff like that. And we have meat made a lot better now and easier to eat now. So we don't need those extra wisdom teeth to chew the, that food. And if our wisdom teeth get uh, infected, then they get taken out. Fun fact, I got my wisdom teeth taken out about like three years ago, four years ago. So, and I'm fine. So uh, or, um, parts of your body, such as your appendix, tonsils, or wisdom teeth, you can get taken out without anything happening because you do not need them anymore because they're vestigial structures. All right. And last, we have biochemistry. I think this is last. I don't know. We'll see. Um, so biochemistry is how closely does DNA look to other species? So the more DNA that matches, the more closely related the species are. And they have a common ancestor. So we actually saw this in the 
I am not exactly sure what lecture it was, but we saw it in one of the lectures. And it was where it compared a human's DNA to other organisms' DNA. And as you remember, the dog had 81% of the same DNA as humans. So 81% of the dog's DNA matched the human's DNA. And that makes sense because dogs and humans are mammals. And that means that they have a common ancestor. And as you can see, we also have a lot of similar DNA to um, chimpanzees and monkeys and stuff like that. So that means that we have a common ancestor with them as well. Um, oh, there is one more thing. All right, so the last thing is speciation. So speciation is the formation of a new species as a result of evolution. And so these species, however, can no longer breed with each other. They can no longer mate with each other and reproduce. So we have some examples. So an environmental change may cause species to be separated and involved in different species. So we have squirrels, we have fish, we have these finches, which these are Darwin's Galapagos finches. So I'm going to explain why he went to the Galapagos and what he found. So Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands and found these finches that all had different sized beaks. So as you can see, their beaks are all different sizes. And the reason for this is because there was a limited amount of food. So these birds, because, so let's say if this bird can only eat seeds. If all birds were just like this bird, then the ones who, when food ran out, when the seeds ran out, the rest of the birds would die. So in order for a, a large amount of finches to be able to live in the same area, they all have to evolve into eating different kinds of foods. So over time, these finches evolved different shaped beaks so they can eat different things. So some finches with different beaks were able to eat fruits or insects or seeds or different size seeds. So over time, these finches evolved different beaks so that they can live in the same area but eat different foods. Because as we know, resources are limited. And also the same thing can happen with where they live. So space is also limited, not just food. And so as you can see in this example here with the lizards, I believe these are lizards, um, we can see that this guy in orange, he or they live in this part. And then these turquoise lizards live in this little part, these yellow, well, they're not yellow, but the one represented by yellow lives in this part. And then we have the purple ones and pink ones and green ones. So they all inhabited different parts of this state because they couldn't overcrowd. And they, if they overcrowded, they would uh, compete too much for the area and then not as many of them would be able to live. So they all, as you can see, they also look different because of the area that they live in. So in order to be able for more of them to be able to survive over time, these lizards evolved different um, habitats and well evolved different characteristics and moved to different habitats and evolved so they could survive in those habitats. And you can see they are dispersed all around this state. All right, and that is all for today. I hope you learned a lot and thought this was super cool because this is one of my favorite. I think next to genetics, evolution is probably my next favorite thing to learn about. And make sure next time you come into Miss uh, Haller's classroom or next time you're virtual, just I'll show you the Darwins. Remember to ask me to show you all the little Darwins around her classroom because they are super cool. All right, that is all for today. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day and that is all. Bye.